All right. So, um, yeah, so we're getting today uh, into mind states, which is the third category of these four categories of mindfulness. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to talk a bit about this category because, first of all, we all have mind states, um, and they really seem to influence us quite deeply. Um, Our state of mind can really impact our behavior, um, can impact the ways that we act, uh, the imp- it really has an impact on ourselves and each other. Um, so there's a, there's a, to me a very big ethical dimension to this um, to this category of experience. And working with it well often means that we become more skillful people. Um, so so that's one thing I think is is quite important. And at the beginning of each of our sessions, and and also uh, many times at the end, we've been doing this state check in, you know, which is just so, sort of saying there is and then a word or two to describe our current state of mind as we come into the session. And this is very much a practice of noticing mind states. We're trying to really work at the beginning of every session on kind of recognizing, okay, this is how I'm feeling. This is the sort of emotion or mood or attitude or state of mind that I'm coming into this experience with. And it's it's not that we should all be in some sort of pleasant or positive or expansive state of mind. Um, rather it's just about kind of a practice of self-honesty. Like this is what's happening. This is how I'm feeling right now. Uh, there's sadness, there's anger, there's boredom, there's tiredness, whatever it is. And I think by doing that, by honoring and acknowledging how we're feeling and voicing that and hearing how other people are feeling, we can kind of enter into a, a group practice period with a little bit more awareness, um, of ourselves and each other. And that that seems to help uh, when when doing this kind of practice together. And then of course, in mindfulness practice, we work with mind states all the time as part of the flow of experience that's coming and going. And I I, I tend to think of mind states very much as as patterns of body-mind. There's these experiences that come that include some physical component. They might have a a tactile sense. There might be some some different um, senses that are activated and involved, our physical senses. And then there's the mental sense that also kind of overlays or comes on top of, uh, mixes with those physical senses. And when those come together in a particular combination, often we call that a mind state. So one good example of this, I think, is, uh, is an emotion that we, many of us experience, and some of us more often than others, <laughs> uh, including myself in this, uh, which is anger. So um, this is an interesting mind state because if you've ever been angry before, you've probably noticed that there is a kind of physical pattern to anger. You know, for me, when I feel angry, I feel sort of heat rising in my body. I feel uh, kind of an increase in um, heartbeat, a sort of pulsing, pumping, pounding experience. Um, and I kind of lose sense of the kind of bottom of half of my body, and I become much more aware of just sensations in the torso and the head, typically. Um, this is the way that I experience the pattern of anger. But all of the sensations I just described, um, they are, aren't in themselves anger, or they, they aren't in themselves Um, this mind state because there's also a mental component that goes with anger. You know, I could have just gone on a run and I could be experiencing all the same sensations. My heart would be pounding. There'd be heat rising in the body. Uh, Maybe I wouldn't be as, uh, there wouldn't be a lack of awareness in the legs. That could be a little different, but still you can imagine having those same physical sensations and not being angry. So what is anger? Anger is the combination of those sensations with some kind of mental overlay. Often there's a story that's on loop. Uh, some kind of mental story that's uh, repeating. Often with anger, uh, we're thinking about whoever's wronged us and we're kind of in a kind of argument in our minds about it, you know, where we're kind of telling them what's true or telling them what's so, um, or feeling, you know, kind of bad for ourselves, you know, sort of uh, telling ourselves a story about how we did nothing wrong and we didn't deserve that. Um, Those are kinds of stories that can be looping with anger. And, and, and the combination of the story and the sensations 
creates this kind of pattern and one that can really just kind of go for a while, you know, <laughs> until we break out of that loop, uh, either the thought loop or, or until we kind of really ground ourselves down into the physical experience and just let go of the, th of the thoughts enough to be present with what anger feels like in the body. Um, it's possible to get c completely stuck for a while in this mind state. Um, and that's one of the interesting things about mind states is that they, they do come and go, but uh, it's, it's definitely possible to kind of get lodged in a mind state for a while to kind of uh, feel like we're kind of embedded in, in that state of mind. And I've already mentioned one of the ways that I think mind states, we can understand mind states, and that's uh, understanding them in terms of emotions. You know, everything that we normally call an emotion from a Western psychological perspective would be included in this kind of category of mind states. So anger, happiness, sadness, all of the sort of typical emotions that we've all learned um, quite young. These would all be included in this category of mind states. And then there's another way of talking about mind states that I think it's, it's, it's very much related to emotions because it's not that, that these aren't emotions, but, but there's a way that we can experience something a little bit differently as a mind state where it becomes more like an attitude of mind, where we're kind of relating to our experience or to each other with a certain kind of attitude. It's almost like a mind state that becomes a kind of filter through which we experience the world. We're relating to, say, the world in a kind of um, aversive way or an open way um, or an interested way, a curious way. This would be both a mind state, and some of these are also could be considered emotions, but, but more they're like attitudes, like ways of relating um, to, to experience and to the world and to each other. And it can be helpful to note these as well, to notice what attitude we currently have. You know, how am I relating currently to my experience? Oh, there's a little bit of anxiety, giving this talk, feeling a little anxious toward what's happening. Okay, now I can notice that. And there's some freedom, there's some space that opens up when I do. Interesting. Okay, now there's interest. Ah, now there's joy. Okay continue to track and see how these states of mind change just by noticing them. And then there's a last category I wanted to mention of a kind of, um, that unfortunately Western uh, culture doesn't do a great job at talking about, which are kind of uh, extraordinary uh, states of consciousness or states that arise often during meditation or during using uh, psychoactive substances or during extreme life events. You know, there's states of consciousness and states of mind that arise, which we, we normally wouldn't think of most of us as an emotion. So one example here I like is um, the state of stillness. You know, who, here, who here thinks of, uh, you know, stillness as an emotion? Anyone? Sometimes people do but not usually, most people don't think of stillness as an emotion. Um, but stillness is similar to emotions because it's got this sort of physical component and it's got a mental component. It's a, it's a pattern of experience. Mm -hmm. And often with stillness, there is a physical component of rest or ease uh, in the body. Ease itself is probably better described as a mind state actually than a physical sensation. So with ease, there's usually stillness, um, relaxation, which is itself kind of like a mind state. So here I'm actually kind of working on differentiating what's a mind state, what's a body sensation. It's challenging actually with some of these states because they feel so peaceful and so restful that in a way, I think we typically don't want to investigate them. We don't want to mess with them. We don't want to disturb them. <laughs> Um, because that's what mindfulness does. It disturbs experience. We're disturbing it by noticing what it's like. We're not just resting always in experience. So stillness has this kind of physical component of ease, relaxation, rest, stillness, non-movement. But it's interesting because it also, we can feel still even while moving. If you've ever done like a Qigong practice or yoga practice and you've suddenly found yourself in a state of stillness, even as you're moving, 
um, then, then that points to the mental component of stillness, you know, that there's a sense of ease, of relaxation, of uh, okayness that can kind of permeate experience, a lack of mental activity where there's just rest. Um, and that state needn't be only experienced when the body is still. It can also be experienced in movement, in flow. Um, and so that's, I think, an interesting example of, of, of a kind of state that I'm talking about. Um, you know, also within this category of kind of meditative states, we could include the traditional Buddhist notions of the Brahma Viharas, you know, all these states of loving kindness or friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. Um, all of these could be definitely called mind states. And, and so too, any kind of state that arises in deep concentrative uh, practice and in meditative absorption, what the Buddhists call jhana, um, any of those states or experiences of deep rest, of bliss, of contentment, of spaciousness, of consciousness itself, of even nothingness, um, these very seemingly formless states of consciousness if they are states, if they are coming and going in our experience, we would call them mind states as well. So all of these things are, are we can call states of mind. So it's, a, it's pretty broad. This category is pretty broad. And, you know, if we look at these four categories, again, kind of like imagining each of them as sort of like uh, as, as, as a rock and, and each kind of stacked one upon the other, like 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 a layers of experience or a stack of experience, then, you know, at the base, you know, kind of the ground upon which all of this is resting are the six senses. And then we have body sensations. We have charge. We have these mind states and we have thoughts. And as you go up the stack, right, it's becoming more abstract. There's more of a mental component until you get to thoughts, which are almost, you know, it's mostly the, the six senses, mostly mental phenomena arising. Uh, although at every layer in the stack, what I would sort of contend uh, or what I would sort of suggest with this model, using that third definition of the body we explored last week, where the body is the six senses, um, then we can also see all of these layers of experience as having a physical and mental component. So it's not that any layer is purely mental or purely physical, even when we're experiencing just basic body sensations, right? There's a tingling, pressure, touching. There's often and very quickly and automatically for most people a kind of mental imagery that arises of mapping the body, mapping the environment. There's a sound and then the, the, the image of a car comes by in our mind's eye. Um, and so they're, they're from a mindfulness perspective when we're kind of breaking experience down and seeing its particle-like nature then we, we could say that um, mind and body are constantly arising, co-arising together, that these six senses are always interacting, interpenetrating, connecting, and so we can't really pull them apart um, completely. So at every layer of the, the stack of the four categories, there is mind and body, but what's different as we go up is it becomes more mental. As we go down, it becomes more physical. So there's almost like a slider. Um, we can kind of go up and down. And, and I think it's important to, to, um, to point this out in part because when we're working at the level of mind states, at this layer of the stack, um, it's always possible to break that layer down. The more abstract stuff can be broken down into its component parts, right, to the elements that make it up. This mind state is made of physical sensations and mental phenomena. Yes, and it's not always helpful to do that. So say you are... Um, having a difficult conversation with a loved one or you're in a therapeutic context and you're exploring something around your feeling life, it's not so helpful to say I'm experiencing tingling, pulsing, and the arising and passing of mental imagery when, <laughs> when you're sharing how you're feeling with this person. It is not the right way to, to talk about your feelings um, in that context. And so, uh, and, and this, I, it's like, who would really do that? Well, actually, some people do do that. You know, when they get really good at Vipassana and they get really good at breaking their sensations down, it, it's tempting to, to, to think that, that these things, 
don't actually aren't real, they don't exist. But that's only true at this level of the stack. Uh, but at this level, if we actually work with mind states at, as mind states, then we can acknowledge their truth of, of, their, of, of our experience at that level. And so I don't really teach mindfulness in such a way where I sort of encourage people to always break experience down uh, and to see what it's always made of. But rather, there's also a skill that can be developed with mindfulness of learning how to move between these layers skillfully, fluidly, appropriately. Um, and to become familiar with them, but not uh, make the mistake of completely reifying any of these experiential uh, categories. Or even, we don't even have to reify the whole model of the four categories. That's another uh, way we can be free, uh, is to recognize, oh, this is just a conceptual model that we're using to help, uh, help us become more skillful in how we work with our human experience.